it now gives me huge pleasure to introduce you to the president of the Geochemical Society, uh, Rick Carlson, who will now be giving the plenary lecture. And where's Rick gone? Where's Rick. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, I, I have to offer my thanks to uh, Chris and, and Bernie and, and all the others who've organized this, particularly the, the Holy AG Association. Uh, I once shared Bernie's uh, uh, f feeling about how hard can it be to organize a meeting, but uh, I worked under Dominique Weiss uh, for the Vancouver meeting, and now I'm uh, in charge of the California meeting next year and uh, working with the G uh, Japanese Geochemical Society for the 2016 meeting, and I can assure you it's not as easy as it sounds. So. Uh, Putting together a meeting like this in a, a city as beautiful as Florence and with 4,000 people, normally when I go to a meeting by the, about Wednesday or Thursday of the week, I get to the point where I'm so saturated with the science and I'm so depressed because, oh, well, why didn't I think of that when I see all the good ideas that are presented? But I've already reached that point this morning, so, so I don't know what's going to happen by the end of the week this time. Uh, there's an odd tradition. I need to switch over this. Uh, there's an odd tradition in the Geochemical Society and EAG with Goldschmidt's is that they invite the <laughs> president of the Associated Society hit that? Uh, to give a lecture. And in most cases, this lecture usually has to do about the state of the Geochemical Society, state of the Geochemical Society, and some other politically correct uh, approach to it. But the beauty of, of geochemistry, I think, is that uh, what I'm being asked to do is, is talk about science which uh, is, I'm very pleased about because I know something about the subject I'm going to talk to you about, much more so than I do about management of the Geochemical Society. So once I get, wait, it won't let me into my own computer. <laughs> hmm. This could go badly. So somebody changed my password while I wasn't looking. <laughs> I have it on a memory stick if we need to go that way. But. That's off, okay. Ah, there we go. It's, it's nice to have somebody who, who's in their, in their, still in their good mind to, to show me that I had the caps lock on. <laughs> and that passwords do matter whether they're, they're case sensitive. All righty, here we go. Sorry for the, the slow start. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so the subject I'd like to talk about today is uh, try to convey to you some of the excitement in the field of our understanding of, of early Earth history, particularly the, the processes by which the Earth is made, uh, the materials from which it was made, and how that assembly of the Earth uh, ended up uh, developing and differentiating an Earth into the kind of planet that we know today. Uh, this is a field that I think has grown dramatically. I, I, I've been in this field for 30 years, and I think the most exciting interval has been the last 10 or so, where there's been a number of uh, new opportunities provided, both by increasing analytical techniques and combinations between uh, uh, geochemical measurements and uh, ast astronomical measurements and theoretical approaches to this problem. So, so that my topic today is how do you make the Earth? Uh, it's a nice narrow subject, and of course on a narrow subject like this I'm not going to claim full responsibility for it. So I've had the opportunity at DTM to work with a very large number of colleagues. Um, the, are shown here. Uh, DTM is a great place to have both colleagues and, and excellent postdocs. So, while uh, uh, I'll be presenting the talk today, and uh, I'll take the blame for the parts that you don't like, these are the people that actually did uh, most of the hard work in it. Uh, of course, this work isn't cheap. In, in fact, it's not even inexpensive. Uh, so uh, we have to thank the financial support that's provided by the host institution, the Carnegie Institution of Washington, and also the U.S. National Science Foundation and, and NASA as well. 
So I'd like to start the story uh, pretty early in Earth history when, when Earth is a, a bunch of uh, micron to submicron grains uh, floating around in a cold molecular cloud at a few tens of degrees Kelvin. So that's pretty early in Earth history. Uh, so we're looking at a, a picture. So the Earth is sitting here as a few zillion little grains, and it's in the presence of an exploding star, just shown in, the, in these kinds of beautiful pictures. So this is uh, an animation that's uh, done of fluid dynamic modeling from my colleague Alan Boss at DTM. What you're looking at here is a molecular cloud uh, that's contoured by density. This is a log scale of density here. So you're at minus 18 and a half or 10 to the minus 18 and a half grams per cubic centimeter, which is a vacuum that most of us would like to get in our mass spectrometers. Uh, we, we never do. Uh, but this is actually a rich region of interstellar space. So this is a, a dense molecular cloud. Dense obviously means different things to different people. Uh, and here is a, a shock wave from a nearby supernova that's going off up here that's going to move through this. So if I can get the animation started. How do you run an animation when it's in this? this mode. Nope, not that way. There we are. All right, so the shockwave is moving through. The main thing that the shockwave does is actually disaggregate the, the molecular cloud. So this starts out being 100 or, or 1,000 uh, solar masses, and you see that most of what's happening is stripping it and sending it back in its little dust grains back into, into the galaxy. But the important part, as far as we're concerned, is that the point up here, uh, the main impact point as this wave is moving through it, is increasing in density. So you see we're already up here to 10 to the minus 17. And by the time this is done, it's compressed this central node on, on what was at once a nice uh, circular cloud into a density that's something like six orders of magnitude greater than it was when it was just floating around in the nebula. So this is the first step in a process that then condenses this material uh, to enough, uh, a high enough density where gravity can take over, it becomes self-gravitating, it, it continues to collapse and forms a central star surrounded by uh, a, a, a disk of dust and gas. So here you see we're up to 10 to the minus 12, so we've increased by six and a half orders of magnitude and density through a process like this. The reason for starting there is that this contribution from outside of our solar system has been a huge uh, advantage to us in terms of understanding, uh, tracking the conditions in the solar nebula and deciding how uh, the composition of the nebula is tracked into planet composition. So one of the things that came in with this supernova are grains like this. Uh, this is a pre-solar silicon carbide grain from, this is a picture from a review paper by Ernst Sinner. Uh, this is a micron, so these things aren't very big. This one is actually one of the prettier ones of it. There's a large number of these now. These were found beginning uh, basically end of the 1980s, uh, and this is a, a, a very big field where they're both silicon carbide and a variety of oxides, so many types of, of grains have been found. This is why they're interesting. So this is an oxygen isotope plot, and for all of you who are used to seeing oxygen isotopes in, in delta notation in per mils, this is the raw ratios on a log scale with five orders of magnitude. So we're not talking about per mil variations here, we're talking about factors of 1,000 or 10,000. So the Earth lies at the intersection of those two lines right here, and what you see are these various grains go out in all sorts of different directions on this diagram in the directions of other stars, novae, supernovae, and these type of stars known as HEB stars. So this is material that's being ejected from these stars. Uh, it's contributing to the, the basic material from which our solar system is made. Uh, here in uh, elements like this, it's particularly useful for understanding the processes of nuclear synthesis. But what I'd like to do today is to turn this around and use it as a tracer of chemical heterogeneity in our solar nebula that may be uh, trapped all the way into planets. And I'd like to do this by looking at another class of uh, pre-solar grains. They're not quite as photogenic. That, that's one of them right there. I don't know if you can see the length scale here. That's a 100 nanometer length scale. So these are about 80 nanometer grains, which is an appropriate size for the type of grains that would be injected by, by a supernova. So this one is a, a chromium aluminum oxide. It's probably chromite. It's hard, hard to tell at that size. Uh, but we measured the chromium isotopic composition uh, by ion probe, this work of uh, Lipping Kin and, and Larry Nittler in particular. Most of the grains on this uh, come out, this is a dissolution residue of, of uh, primitive meteorite. This is a terrible thing that meteoriticists do to them. You take five kilograms of meteorite, you dissolve everything away except the stuff that doesn't dissolve, and it turns out that that's uh, uh, usually on the order of a few parts per million of the total meteorite, but it's all pre-solar material. So most of this actually is uh, normal terrestrial chromite. So these big grains are chromite. They all plot down here within the field uh, for our terrestrial normals. But a small percentage of these have these extreme anomalies. So up here you're looking at 150% excesses in, in chromium-54. Uh, and in fact, that's, a, that's an underestimate because you're getting 
with an ion beam size that's bigger than that grain you're sampling normal chromium around it. So there are at least factors of several larger than uh, terrestrial values for, for 54 chromium abundance. The way that you make uh, chromium-54 is a supernova. So this is a grain that condensed in the outflow from some other supernova. The reason I wanted to bring in uh, this uh, subject is that uh, it turns out that chromium and a few other isotopes in the Iron Peak region uh, have been able now to classify meteorites according to groups and separate them. So you see these are a series of nice slides from a, a sort of a summary paper from uh, Paul Warren uh, with data from a number of other authors. And you see here's 54 chromium versus oxygen. This is the separation from the uh, mass dependent fractionation line of the earth. This is nickel, this is uh, titanium here. So these are all iron peak elements. But the important point about this is that these offsets in these stable isotopes are all due to nucleosynthesis. This carbonaceous chondrites, which are all the black symbols here, lie off in a completely different field than, than most of the meteorite groups. Earth and moon are here, here, and here. So they're sort of in the middle of this field. And then there's other groups of meteorites, the uh, ordinary chondrites here, the H chondrites, various types of differentiated meteorites lying out here. So what this is showing us is something that we probably should have known all along, is that the Earth most likely is not made of any one meteorite group uh, by itself. It's likely made of a mixture of all the stuff that was floating around in the nebula. And what we're seeing now for the first time is the ability to track that because we're tracking it with this nuclear synthetic contribution. And in the case of chromium, at least, it was not homogenized in the nebula well enough to, to lose its signature. So it probably came in in late stages of the evolution, probably from the supernova that, that uh, started the condensation of our solar system. So with that then, uh, the other contribution that's been provided by uh, uh, our galaxy are this whole variety of short-lived radionuclides. This field has exploded. This has been around for at least 30 years, but this table is getting longer all the time, and the applications of it are, are getting much more diverse. The beauty of this system is that you've got all of these isotopes with half-lives ranging from a few hundred thousand years to on the order of 100 million years. So it's a perfect time scale to date events that are occurring on the thousands to uh, millions of years time scale in the early, Earth, uh, early solar system history. Um, the other advantage to this, and I think the more important one, is that this group of elements represents a huge range in chemical compositions from noble gases to refractory elements to volatile siderophile elements. And because of this, you can use uh, these systems to track probably the, the whole series of most important differentiation processes involved in planet formation differentiation. So things like condensation and volatile loss metal silicate separation, so core formation in essence, and then differentiation of the silica part of the planet, the formation of, of cores and mantles. So one of the first things that, that this uh, application has told us, and I think one of the more important things that's changing our view about how planets are formed, is that d planetary differentiation started very early. So here's an example of a group of meteorites known as angrites. These are basically, at least one group of them are lava flows onto some planetesimal. You see here, they're dated by the conventional systems of uranium lead. This is by Yuri Amelin's work, uh, 4564, with some revision to the uranium isotopic composition. It's not, not normal. Uh, it comes down to 4563. And then here's just some examples of other systems that apply to the same meteorite. This is the uh, hafnium tungsten system, decaying uh, 182 hafnium to 182 tungsten. The manganese chromium, which is 53 manganese to 53 chromium decay. So this is 3 million years. This is 9 million year half-life. And the key to this is if you look over here at the ages, all of these are giving ages of about 4563. So there's two important points about that. One is that the errors are in the few hundred thousand year range. So we're getting 100,000 year resolution on events happening four and a half billion years ago. Uh, it turns out that's, that's the same as knowing your age to within a half a day. So it's not too bad. We're, you know, we'll we'll, we'll get, get down better than that soon, but, but it's not doing too bad. Uh, the other thing, though, that's important about this is that these ages, so the accepted uh, age for the first uh, condensates in the solar system is about 4568 in round numbers. Uh, we're arguing about that decimal place on it now. Uh, so 4567 to 4568. So you're looking at a planetary differentiation event here that's occurring within a couple, two, three, four, five million years of, of the start of solar system history. And given the length of time that the Earth probably grew over, uh, back in my day uh, uh, as a URI student, we were told that planets formed by the slow accumulation of undifferentiated planetesimals that came in and, the, and they just sort of mixed together and, and formed the planet. But what most likely happened is that those planetesimals grew rather quickly into planetary embryos of hundreds to a thousand kilometers in diameter. That's big enough to undergo melting by aluminum 26 heating in one of the short-lived radionuclides. 
So it's quite likely that instead of forming out of primitive undifferentiated material, the Earth was growing from the addition of these embryos that had already undergone global melting, had already separated out cores and mantles from one another, and possibly crusts, and possibly some of those crusts had been uh, eroded by collisions with other, other planetesimals. So this revised view of what the Earth is forming of, uh, I think, has, has led us to reinterpret some of the, the features that we've known about Earth composition for a long time. Uh, one of those, uh, this is a, a slide that's been shown in various guises for, for 30 years or more. Uh, this is a plot of the whole periodic table, uh, quite literally. Uh, I don't think noble gases are on this, but it's plotted against the 50% condensation temperature of these elements in a gaseous solar nebula composition and a pressure appropriate for the solar nebula. Uh, so what you see here is the refractory elements here with the bulk earth composition, the refractory elements plot up here near solar values. So the solar values is determined by CI1, it would be CI. So they're a little bit uh, high, uh, and there's some argument about that. But basically, they're unfractionated from one another. But as you go down to elements that not, you know, only cosmic chemists would be considering volatile, things like chromium and manganese, you see the fall off in condensation temperature. You also see a fall off in the abundance of these in the Earth. So it's pretty clear that the, the Earth's bulk composition is tracking this volatile refractory separation that's most likely occurring in the nebula, and I'll, I'll try to prove that. These other boxes here, all these open symbols are the elements that are, are siderophilic, the elements that dissolve preferentially in, in iron metal and went into the core. So these are depleted in Earth's mantle, but they may very well be enriched in Earth's core. So if you add the two together, these may come, come up to this trend. But the point being is that we do see this volatile depletion. And we can ask with these short-lived systems and with traditional systems, when did this volatile depletion occur? We can use rubidium and strontium and manganese and chromium to address this issue. So that's done here. Uh, rubidium strontium, uh, this approach has been done going back to Dmitry Papanastasio in, in the late 60s actually started this. Uh, the interesting aspect about rubidium strontium for this application is that the solar nebula has a very high rubidium strontium ratio, CI chondrites, something like this. This causes 87, 86 strontium to grow in very rapidly with time. So if you volatile deplete a planet, you lower its rubidium strontium ratio, it's going to begin to diverge off to this side of, of the line. So you can go and you can look at uh, terrestrial rocks, and so far the lowest measured value for terrestrial rock uh, is this Archean barite uh, at 7005. This is from Malcolm McCulloch's work of, of quite a few years ago now. If you just take that number and you look at the CI curve and see where it would plot, it comes out at an age of something like 44, 49, and it's really not that precise uh, million years. So something like 4.4 4. 4 billion years or so. And that's only an upper limit because there had to have been some evolution within the Earth prior to the formation of this barite. So you can go and try to find lower estimates of the 8786 in the Earth. You can go to the moon if you think the moon uh, is a sample of the Earth at an early time. This has a much lower value. This is from, from our work on uh, one of the crustal rocks. You see it plots down here. It has a delta T where delta T is relative to the start of solar system formation at 4568 of only three and a half million years. You go to the angrites, which is another type of volatile depleted object. It's more like three million years. So even from these old approaches, we, we're knowing that the Earth's volatile depletion was pretty much a congenital defect. So it was born with this type of, of volatile depletion. We can go to a short-lived system and get higher resolution of that. So this is a manganese chromium isochron. This is from a, a paper that's going to come out in the Treatise of Geochemistry sometime, I'm told. Uh, I, I'm an editor of this, so I can complain. Uh, but it, it should be due out this year. Uh, it's a nice summary of a, of, of a number of chromium, uh, manganese chromium work on uh, chondritic meteorites. You see here they define a relatively nice correlation between manganese chromium ratio, and this is 53 to 52 chromium ratio in parts in 10,000. You see there's a range. The range in manganese chromium ratio is almost certainly due to volatility. So the more volatile uh, manganese gets low in volatile depleted objects moving down this way. We don't exactly know the Earth's manganese chromium ratio. We do know it's uh, chromium 53 because it's the standard that we use to define zero. So it lies here, and it depends where it plots. Uh, where it plots depends on uh, your assumption about how much manganese and chromium are in the core. But the point is, is it's plotting right in the uh, region that would fall on this, this sloped uh, correlation. And that slope corresponds to an age of 4567 million years, which is pretty much within uncertainty of the, the initial condensation of the solar system. So basically, the Earth never had these volatile elements in it. It, it was formed from volatile depleted objects, and we know that from this, this type of application. So what I'd like to do then is, is switch over and, and uh, talk about uh, um, 
the silicate differentiation of plants. So we formed a core that's inherited this volatile depletion. I'll move over to silicate differentiation. And a good system for that that we've been using now uh, for quite some time is samarium and neodymium. So these are two neighboring rare earth elements. They have similar chemistry. They're both refractory, so they're not separated by volatility and, and condensation effects. They're, neither one of them are siderophile uh, in most cases, so they're not as affected by core formation. But the important part about them is there's two embedded radiogenic decay schemes in them. One is the long-lived system that's been in use since the early 70s, 147 samarium decays to 143 neodymium, half-life of 100 billion years. So it's still around, most of it's still around, and it's uh, still keeping time for us. The other one, though, is the 146 samarium uh, decays to 142 neodymium with a half-life that's on the order of 70 million years. So this was present when the Earth formed, but it's long since uh, decayed away. And you can think about that in this kind of a plot. So this is the 146 samarium, the radio radioactive isotope, to 144 samarium, the stable. So it started at a ratio in the solar system of something like 008. It decayed away at that rate, so that by six or 800 million years into Earth history, 146 samarium is gone. So it's no longer a functioning chronometer or geochemical tracer. And the complement to that, then, is the ingrowth of 142 neodymium, which does the same thing. So the beauty of this short-lived system is that if you see variations in 142 neodymium, they had to occur in this time window. So after 146 is gone, you can erase 142 variation by mixing between different reservoirs, but you cannot create new variation. So if you see 142 variation, it's an unquestionable sign that differentiation was occurring in the first half billion years of Earth history. So uh, back in 2005, uh, Maud Boyer, when she was a postdoc at DTM, uh, more on this topic was this morning, so I hope you saw that talk, uh, uh, presented these data that's a comparison between 142 neodymium and chondritic meteorites uh, and the Earth. So the Earth is here. Uh, part of the, the, the uh, issues that kept us from using the system for so long is that the precisions had to be good enough. So here's the precision we had at the time. It's about plus or minus five parts per million in this ratio. Uh, you see here all the chondrite data that we have available. So C chondrites plot down to as much as 40 parts per million below terrestrial. O's are about 20. Encetite chondrites overlap. Most are low, but some overlap in the terrestrial field. And this is uh, the eukaryote parent body, a differentiated planetesimal, probably the asteroid Vesta. So you see that the Earth is offset from uh, all these meteorites in 142, or most of them anyway. Uh, and there's two explanations for this. One is the one that Maud talked about today. As it turns out, 142 neodymium is made by a dif different nucleosynthetic process. It's primarily S process nucleosynthesis, whereas 144 neodymium is primarily made by the R process. So if you change the ratio of these two processes, you can change the 142-144 neodymium ratio by nucleosynthetic mixing as opposed to radiogenic decay of 146 samarium. So that's a possibility, and we're still working on that. Uh, Maud gave a very good summary of that this morning. But the other possibility is that this difference represents the decay of 146 samarium. Uh, so the Earth would have a higher samarium medium ratio than most of the chondrites plotting out here. It turns out this sort of order of 20 parts per million difference in 142 nidium requires a, a samarium nidium ratio that's something like 6% higher than chondritic. This ratio doesn't vary very much in chondrites because these are two refractory lithophile elements. They're just not fractionated in nebular processes. So the beauty, though, then comes with the combined decay scheme. So if you, you have a 20 parts per million a difference in 142 that you're trying to explain be, as a result of samarium decay, you also have to see a corresponding effect in 147 uh, samarium to 143 neodymium. So these lines all produce a 142 neodymium excess of 20 parts per million compared to, to chondritic, uh, but they do it at different times. So uh, how high you have to change the samarium ratio depends on what time you do it. So if you start very early, this is five million years after solar system history, you get this red line because the samarium neodymium ratio to make that 20 parts per million is only 209. In 143 space, this is 143, not 142, it would evolve out here. If you wait 100 million years, most of the 146 has already decayed away, or half of it anyway, uh, and you need a higher samarium neodymium ratio then to create the 20 parts per million variation 142, and then that high samarium neodymium ratio will produce a line like this. So also plot on this diagram, then, are the data for old terrestrial rocks down here. You see a majority of them, or a number of them anyway, plot above a zero. And then mid-ocean ridge basalts here, which probably represents a, a maximum value for the present uh, uh, modern mantle, if you will. So if you pick a, a scenario like this, you're going to end up with an Earth composition that has a 143, 144 neodymium, then, is, then we can accommodate uh, based on mid-ocean ridge basalts. But if you start here, you're still below this point. 
So it is possible that uh, if you had chondritic evolution, you'd be here. If you didn't have a chondritic Earth, you would expect the 143 to be up here. So is there a way that we can check this on, on the Earth? And the answer is we can compare the neodymium results uh, in oceanic basalts and interplate basalts, things that are derived by melting of the mantle, uh, for other tracers of primitiveness or primordial undifferentiated material. One that's commonly used is helium isotopic composition. Helium-3 is mostly not radiogenic. It's mostly just a primordial isotope. Helium-4 is largely generated from the decay of uranium and thorium and a little bit from samarium, alpha particles, right? So uh, if you look at this diagram, it's plotted versus 143, 144 here. Uh, these are all the data for various types of uh, interoceanic basalts. All the islands and, and flood basalts are shown here by name. If uh, the Earth was largely chondritic and samarium neodymium ratio, and that was the primitive undifferentiated mantle, then you would expect that to correlate with high helium-3-4 ratios. So here's the chondritic point. But what you see is that the data points actually increase in this direction. The highest values are at Baffin Island, which is a part of the uh, North Atlantic flood basalt province. So the highest helium-3-4 values. And these plot right in this gray region, which is the re region that you would predict in 143 space based on the 20 parts per million offset in 142 neodymium. So instead of suggesting that the Earth is chondritic, the primitive helium signal is actually accompanied by uh, or attached to this, this radiogenic neodymium isotopic composition, uh, again coincident with the, the suggestion the Earth is not chondritic in these refractory lithophile elements. So, you know, who cares? These are too obscure. They're called rare Earths for a reason, right? So two obscure elements. It's 20 parts per million. Only, only 2,000 geochemists would care about this. Uh, but the difference comes in, in a diagram like this. Uh, if you had a chondritic Earth, uh, the primitive uh, composition, an estimate of a chondritic composition would be this, this flat line. This is just by definition because we're normalizing to that, that model. But what we're talking about now is an Earth that doesn't look like that. It looks more like these red or green points depending on, on, on how much of the Earth is, is this composition. So, you know, you look, and again, that, that's probably only uh, something a geochemist would love, but you get down here, and the elements on this plot include elements like thorium, uranium, and also potassium would plot down at this end. The important point of this, then, is that the abundances of those radioactive elements is something like 60% of their abundance you would predict from a chondritic Earth model. So the key to this, these are the heat-producing elements in the Earth's mantle. With this kind of a model, you just lowered that heat production by almost a factor of two. This has huge genomic implications, huge implications for the thermal evolution of the Earth. So it really does matter if, if we want to understand solid Earth evolution. So an interesting question then comes is, uh, you have this as uh, the accessible amount that we can reach. Uh, if the Earth, in fact, form with chondritic SMND ratio, and this is a result of some type of differentiation, that differentiation is most likely due to partial melting. We can see that very clearly in the mid-ocean ridge basalt. So this is the, the mantle source region of, of mid-ocean ridge basalts. We see this in the continental crust, which is complementary to that. Nominally, in the old model, if you add this plus this, you end up with a flat pattern. But what we're looking at now is saying that this is uh, what you should add up to. And if you want to add back to chondritic, you have to have some other reservoir, early enriched reservoir. That's what these silly acronyms mean. Or I think we introduced these mo modernized, so you can blame us. But uh, so the size enrichment of this reservoir depends on how small it is. We have no constraints on that. If this is uh, a large fraction of the mantle, it's like a third of the lower mantle, it's only enriched by a little bit. If it's a very small reservoir, just a couple percent of the mantle, like D double prime, you see that it's actually quite enriched in these elements and it is approaching a continental crust in composition. So, uh, there's two models now that are being debated. You, uh, if you were at the session this morning, one possibility is that this was the Earth's first crust and it had been eroded by impacts. So early impacts preferentially removed the crust of the Earth and this is simply gone. So the bulk Earth is actually a composition that looks more like this. But the other possibility is one that, that we suggested is in fact there is something in the Earth that looks like this. It has to be restricted from appearing at the Earth's surface because we've never seen uh, rocks with the, the isotopic characteristics that we would expect for that reservoir. And we, we've received a lot of flack for that and I'm not yet will, willing to give up. I'm close, but I'm not yet willing to give up. Because of this image, this is seismic tomography of the Earth's mantle, particularly the deep mantle. So this is red eye and blue eye in, in the in uh, you know, seismology terms. So red, of course, is slow seismic velocities. Blue is fast seismic velocities. Uh, I think you can see the continents there. This is at the base of the mantle. So an interpretation of this is the blue stuff are subducted slabs that have made their way all the way down to the bottom of the mantle. So this is mantle material that's unusually cold for that position in the mantle. Being cold makes you fast seismically, so that's why it's blue in these diagrams. And then you have these red areas that are sort of trapped between the, the subduction zones on either side of them. 
And these red areas represent hot material that will give you slow seismic velocities, but they uh, apparently are much more than just temperature related. Uh, there are things like sharp sides to them. It turns out, uh, working with Edgar and Aaron, there's actually well-defined tops to these uh, things. They're known as LLSUPs. They used to be known as super plumes, but have, that has a connotation about what they might be. So they're called LLSUPs, which as a speaker is a terrible thing to do. Uh, they're large, low shear velocity provinces, which describes them adequately, but provides no uh, interpretive uh, characteristic to them. So this is a cartoon, this, this is real data, uh, but they have all these characteristics, including areas that have such low velocities that they're probably partially melted. So these are very funny materials at the base of the mantle, and the more we learn about them seismically, the more uh, unusual they, they are. So there's two interpretations of this. One is that these are just slab materials. So this stuff that went down to the man base of the mantle was floating around there long enough to either rewarm itself from its own radioactivity or to get some heating from the core, and basically they're ready to start coming up into the mantle and remixing it uh, into that. There's a number of arguments, though, that suggest that they, they might be long-lived features, and if they are long-lived features, then uh, they potentially could be uh, residues left over from early Earth differentiation. You have to endow them with certain properties, particularly a density that overwhelms their, their temperature, uh, but the interesting possibility is that these, in fact, do represent this early enriched reservoir. Uh, I don't think, you know, seismology isn't the world's best geochemical tool, so I don't think we're going to answer it from the seismic results, but what we have a chance to do, so this can form a model, we can sort of assign guesstimates to the uranium and thorium concentrations in these uh, based on various models about what they might be, either subductive crust or, or uh, this early enriched reservoir. But we can have the potential, or at least we have the technology to measure this. This is a uh, plot of geoneutrino flux calculated basically for that uh, tomography model. So geoneutrinos are, are produced uh, from the decay of uranium thorium. Their interaction with matter is almost nil, not exactly nil, otherwise we wouldn't be able to measure them, but it's almost nil. Uh, so they basically uh, transmit through the whole Earth. So in that model that I showed you in the tomography, if those are enriched uranium and thorium, you should get hot spots in the geoneutrino flux at the Earth's surface over the, the uh, African and the Pacific uh, large low shear velocity provinces. Uh, at the moment, the only geoneutrino detectors are on land-based systems, so these triangles here. The trouble with that is that continents are full of uranium and thorium, so most of the signal that they measure is the continental crust directly underneath them. If you could get away from the continental crust, and there's a proposal for a, an ocean-based uh, geoneutrino detector in Hawaii here that would also go and you could sink it to the base of the ocean, you uh, could potentially resolve this uh, sort of uh, uranium tomography, if you want to call it that, and understand finally the, the question of whether the upper and lower mantle are the same composition, whether these uh, materials at the large low shear velocity province might be some really unusual material or just parts of the mantle convection system that, that we know uh, very well. So I'd like to uh, shift over a, a bit on the topic to, we've seen this evidence, there, there's, uh, the Earth is not chondritic in 142, uh, and we want to figure out why, look at the processes that may have caused this working on the Earth. We can look at 142 Nidimian variations in Earth rocks. So these are not the difference between chondritic. Uh, zero here is terrestrial. There's no chondrite shown on this diagram. Basically, all rocks measured today, all sorts of different ro rock types are in here from a number of authors, show no resolvable variation in 142 Nidimium. But as you go back in time, you have both very positive values here at Isua and now some negative values from, uh, this is the work of Hanna Carrizo. Uh, and there's a suggestion that these, in fact, decline with time. So suggesting that the early Earth's mantle might have been more heterogeneous uh, or at least as heterogeneous as the, as the later mantle. But this is reflecting differentiation events. Again, remember, this is 142 that had to happen in the 4.3 to 4.5 billion year old window. So basically, in these early Archean rocks, you're seeing a memory of the initial differentiation of the Earth. So I'd like to look at one of these as just an example. We've been doing a lot of work with uh, Jonathan O'Neill as a postdoc, uh, first a student at McGill and then a postdoc at DTM on this, this place that nobody can pronounce, Nuvoagatuck. It's, it's easy, what's the problem? So, so this one point here, uh, that one point doesn't do service to the amount of work that's been done. The interesting aspect of this province is that uh, most early Archean terrains are mostly composed of granite, granitic rocks in the sense of Lado, things like trongemites and tonalites. This area is mostly uh, mafic rocks. Uh, the interpretations are volcanic rocks. All these are very high-grade metamorphic rocks, so there's a lot of interpretation taking them back to an igneous progenitor. But the key is there's something like over 90% of them are mafic rocks, and I'll explain why that's important in a second. Uh, so there's uh, what we interpret as lava flows or near source volcanic sediments. There are ultramafic sills. This is a, a metamorphic equivalent of that. 
Uh, and one of the things that supports the idea that these are actually lava flows is that there are uh, very distorted pillow lavas. So not only these are, are lava flows, they are lava flows into water. So the, there's no question that these are old rocks because all the surrounding material here are tonalitic rocks that have zircons that provide ages up to about 3.75 to 3.8 billion years. So this is an old province, no matter who you listen to. Uh, it's uh, very mafic, which is interesting. It's got these exhalative uh, water-driven sediments, things like quartz formation, which is a name for exhalative silica deposit in an Archean metamorphic belt, uh, and, and banded iron formations, and then they're surrounded by this uh, 3.8 billion year old uh, felsic uh, material. If you look at those mafic rocks, uh, as I mentioned, they're, they're high-grade metamorphic rocks, so when I use the term basalt, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, these uh, rocks have undergone lots of metamorphism, so you turn to immobile elements like aluminum and titanium in particular to understand their geochemical characteristics. So you see they basically split out into three groups here based on aluminum and titanium. If you run with those three groups on the basis of the major elements in, you plot silica, which is unquestionably mobile in these systems, but if you just look at the histograms, they're on the order of 50% silica to as much as 60, so these are in the range of basalts. Magnesium concentrations are in the sort of 5 to 15% range with a lot of variability. So again, sort of basaltic. And then you look at rare earth patterns for the groups. You've got one group has these nice flat rare earth patterns, this unusual group that shows a, a depletion in the middle rare earth, and then a turn up in the light rare earth elements, and another one shows flat, heavy rare earth, and an upturn in the light rare earth. Now, I don't want to go into the details of all this, but the reason for showing you this is that if I showed you these patterns and telling you that these occurred in the Marianas in a modern arc setting, you know, people would ask, okay, and you know, we'd go into the processes there, how these were formed. These would not be surprising uh, to see in a modern uh, convergent margin setting, but these are in rocks that are at least 3.8 billion years old, and we would argue even older. The beauty of this is that if you think about the Earth's first crust, there's an increasing dependence on zircon dating, and, and for good reason. It's a magnificent dating tool that provides lots of information, especially when combined with hafnium as a geochemical tracer. You can learn a lot about Earth's early history from zircon. But one of the problems with zircon is it primarily forms in these uh, evolved felsic rocks. So if you think about Earth's first crust, and it's made by melting the mantle, the mantle's down here on this olivine silica uh, CPX phase diagram. You melt that, you don't get this. You get something up here, which is basically basalt in, in the broadest sense of the term. The way that you get down here is either to differentiate this to the nth degree to get it down here, uh, in which case there's volume problems, or more likely what you do is you hydrate that metamorphically and you remelt it to make these felsic rocks. So these felsic rocks that we're increasingly dependent on are probably second stage crustal products derived from melting uh, a mafic platform. And you can see that, here's a couple of models just uh, pulled out, Jonathan put this slide together, from Camberdal and Kempidal. And what these guys are working on are, are zircons, and they come out of these felsic pods in this. But the thing that we like to point out in this kind of diagram is the background material here is this mafic platform material, which usually is not preserved in these provinces, but it is preserved in the Nuvoagatuck. So the problem, though, when you've got mafic platform like this is that you uh, have to date it. Uh, how you do that is, is a good question. Uh, there's no zircons in this, there's no igneous zircons because the rock has 50 parts per million zirconium. Uh, you can date it with some aramidimium with the conventional system here. You get a, something that looks like a line, gives you a 3.6 billion year age, it's not unrealistic. But if you look at that line in detail, you see there's huge amounts of noise to it. And if you look at the individual chemical groups separately, you get ages that are more like 2.7 billion years, which is the time of garnet growth in this area, the time of peak metamorphism. So we would argue that this system, in fact, is not giving you the igneous age of these rocks. It's telling you about the later metamorphic history, or it's so, so perturbed by that that you can't see the original igneous event. But when you turn to 142 nidimium, this is what you get. If you look at all the, uh, the jar look as this, this mafic unit, uh, maf we would argue mafic volcanic units coming tonight, amphibolite gneisses for those of you who know rock names, uh, it provides a, a correlation in between 142 in this case and SMND that provides an age of 4.4 billion years. That's all of them together. We've been criticized for putting all these unrelated rocks together in the same isochron, and that's a good valid criticism, but if you take them apart in the individual chemical groups, you still get reasonable correlations, and all these correlations define similar types of ages in near 4.4 billion years. So there's two interpretations of that. Ours is that this is the igneous age of these rocks, and you're really seeing examples of the Earth's first crust. The alternative interpretation is these represent some sort of mixing line between an early component and normal mantle, which would plot here. And you'll, if you go to the Thursday session, you'll get to see both sides of this argument. But in either case, what we're looking at, neither group disagrees that what's recorded here are products of early Earth differentiation. We would say that these are, in fact, the first crust. 
uh, the other group would probably say that these include a, a component from that early differentiation. But that differentiation occurred about 4.3 billion years ago, 4.3 to 4.4. So I'm near the end, and, and what I'd like to do then is key on this age of 4.3, 4.4. Uh, it's turning out to uh, appear more often than we expected, and the coincidence of its occurrence in various rock types, as I'll show you, uh, is I think an interesting observation. So here's one uh, point where it occurs. If you go to the moon and you take uh, uh, Mari basalts and crustal rocks, the model uh, for moon formation is a giant impact into the Earth. It went out into space. It reaccumulated and melted and, and had basically a global mag motion from which you, you differentiated a crust and mantle. You put these points on a 142, this is versus 143, but you could think of this as an SMD uh, isochron diagram in 142 space. This delta t equals zero line is the 4568 million year line. And there's, you know, there's a lot of noise here, but one thing these data do not do is fall along a 4568 million year line. So the moon is not as old as 4568. You look at these points, you can fit various types of lines depending on which groups of data that you put in, but one of these, this blue line here, provides a mag motion crystallization age of something like 120 million years after T0, so after 4.56, that puts you down at 4.44. Uh, I'm not going to argue about the, you know, the accuracy of that age, but the point is it's not 4.568, it's more like 4.4 to 4.45. So let's look at some other uh, cases of this. This is a long table. I'm not going to go through all this. And I don't even know if you can read it or care to read it. But the point is if you look at these ages, these are, ages, uh, these are ways that you could uh, estimate the age of the moon through uh, analyses of, of uh, lunar rocks. And all sorts of different ways, lunar crustal rocks, lunar mantle rocks would be this one, going back in time to the Terran Wasserberg 1974 lead model age. You look at that list of data, there's no 4.56 4 ages on that. There's a lot of 4.4 to 4.45 ages on that. So they're all younger than 4.56. And then you go and you start asking the question, well, what's really the age of the Earth? Now, the age of the Earth with these type of dating systems is most likely to reflect the last major igneous differentiation of the Earth. By major, I mean global, so a mag motion on the Earth. And that's probably associated with the last giant impact on the Earth, the one that created the moon. So you ask this question, what are the possibly relevant ages of, uh, uh, from the Earth? Uh, you get the peak in the zircons uh, from these Hadean zircons in Australia. The peak in the ages is like 4350. There's one one point in one zircon that's 4.4, but there's none that are 4.56. Now this doesn't have to represent the age of the Earth, but it's the oldest age of these zircons. Uh, you get uranium lead ages of the Earth. This number varies all over the place. I've quoted Allegra here. This kind of an age though goes back to Patterson in the 50s, but the point is that if you just treat the data just in the simple way, you get an age that's more like 4.45 instead of 4.55. Uh, the iodine xenon age of the atmosphere, again, there's interpretive uh, aspects of this, but 4.47 is from Pepin and Percelli. Uh, the model age from Isua, as done by Caro and by, uh, by Rizzo et al., comes out here at 4.47 billion years, and our age for the Nuvo Agatuck, we would argue, is 4.40 billion years. So the key to this, then, is that these ages are very young in terms of our understanding of the time scale of planet formation. So what I would propose to you is that models of Earth formation, uh, we always think of this hellish early Earth, right? You've always seen these, these beautiful paintings. This, this is you know, artist's conception, right? This is not a picture of anything uh, that look like this. You know, this is what you'd like to think that the early Earth looks like. And I would agree that this early Earth might have looked at that, like that at around 4.45 billion years ago, right after the giant impact. But if our age data for the new Boagatuck is correct, uh, we've got basaltic rocks erupting at 4.4 billion years, carrying a signature similar to those rocks produced in modern convergent margins. Some of them follow differentiation trends that are consistent with wet, wet lavas, so the wet partial melting of the mantle. Uh, this is perfectly consistent with the data coming out from the, the zircons, the Hadean zircons in Australia that show uh, the uh, presence of oxygen isotope variation suggesting of water in their sources. So by 4.4 billion years ago, the Earth may have looked like this, this pretty fanciful figure. I, wa I, I won't say there's stromatolites in, at 4.4, but, but at least there, was, there were oceans or large bodies of water. There were volcanoes that were occurring that not, were not all that dissimilar, the type of melting processes, differentiation processes that are occurring on Earth today. So this really is an interesting era of Earth history where we did this major differentiation, and then we got down very quickly to a system that looks like the type of geological processes that we know in the modern Earth. 
And that's my last slide. So I'll leave you with the conclusions. Earth inherited a variety of comp compositional characteristics. Uh, the volatile depletion is very clearly a congenital defect of the Earth. There's this isotopic distinction that's increasing in a, a we're, Every, every year at the Lunar Planetary Science Conference in Goldschmidt, we see different uh, isotope anomalies reported. So the Earth is becoming increasingly anomalous in these, and we have to see how, we have to understand how these isotopic anomalies translate into compositional. I would argue the Earth-Moon differentiation is surprisingly late. It occurred more like 4.45 than 4.55 billion years ago. And I would say that the accessible Earth, the Earth that comes up uh, towards the, the Earth's crust, uh, is de slightly depleting these highly incompatible elements, uh, incompatible lithophile elements. And this solves a lot of problems that we've had traditionally with looking at, at mantle geochemistry, uh, ranging from why the most common uh, uh, nadimian isotopic composition in, in ocean island basalts is not chondritic, uh, things like the argon paradox, where if you go with a chondritic earth, only half the argon 40 produced over Earth history is in the atmosphere. If you go with a non chondritic earth, then you lower the potassium concentration in the mantle by a factor or two, so there's no longer a paradox here. So these uh, go away with this idea of, of an Earth that's slightly non-chondritic in these elements. And I would say that we have a broadly uh, basaltic crust in place. So the Earth's first crust was in place by 4.4 billion years ago. The surfing conditions, you had liquid water, which tells you something about the surface environment of the Earth, and you were having melting going on in the shallow mount mantle following the type of melting trends that we see today. So at least the, the outer 100, 200 kilometer geotherm of the Earth was not all that different from what we see today. So it's a very rapid uh, transition from an early Earth with massive differentiation to something that uh, formed the type of geological process that we're studying uh, in the modern world. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rick. That was an absolutely fantastic overview of um, early Earth processes and, and origins. It's very difficult in such a large arena to take, uh, ask uh, questions, but we do have a little bit of time, and if somebody's got some questions, we've, please put up your hands and speak up very loudly. The question was, where do you think the volatiles come from? I, 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 think, in, speak yeah, I think increasingly, uh, I, I'm a big fan of late veneers. So I, I'm a, a fan of the addition of material after uh, core formation was complete. And uh, you know, so the, the basically, most of the Earth is formed as volatile depleted objects. And you add the volatiles that we have late. Um, late meaning 4.4 something. So not that late, but uh, not as a component of Earth formation. If there are no more questions, then I would like to thank Rick once more time and bring this to a close. <laughs>